you know, four weekends ago, Jordan gave us the definition of an identity crisis. And here is that definition. It's a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure. And you know, from time to time in some people's lives, that happens when, when things like the, the children go off to college and uh, the person that you had been for the last 29 years, <laughs> for the last 17 or 18 or 19 years is suddenly pulled out from under you, under you and you are suddenly someone else. This can happen. It can happen when someone loses a long-standing career. And a similar thing, that the, the person that you thought you were was been pulled out from under you like a rug. And, and you suffer an identity crisis. But unfortunately, this is the reality. This is the reality for a lot of people who are followers of Jesus for their entire lives. As Christians, they walk through this life without ever knowing who they really are in Christ. In the first chapter, and by the way, as you may remember, and, and if you have your Bibles with you, our passage is going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 1. And if you don't have your Bible with you, I'll have the verses up on the screen. But Ephesians chapter 1 is where the longest, as I've said virtually every week, we are in a series. We are working our way through the entire book of Ephesians. And for the first few weeks, and today we're going to wrap it up, it, it, we're going to do a, a series of different mini-series throughout the book. Well, today we're going to wrap up the first of those series that is entitled Knowing Who You Are. And in the first chapter, the first 14 verses of, of Ephesians chapter 1, uh, we find the longest sentence, Greek, grammatically speaking, the, the longest Greek sentence in the entire New Testament. It's 12 verses long in the English, from, from verses 3 through 14. One big long verse. And remember what, I, what we said early on. Everything in this big long sentence hangs on the first part of it. And so, and, and that qualifies the rest of the entire sentence, which is, again, verses 3 through 14. So please understand that when we get to that point. I'll, but in uh, the first chapter, where that longest uh, Greek New Testament sentence is, it is where we've been the last several weeks, and we've been revealing what Paul wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in that series called Knowing Who You Are. And the opposite of this identity crisis definition is this, this statement. It, it is what we have been looking at every single week, and that is our identity statement about who we as followers of Jesus really are. And we crafted this sentence, and to, sum, to try to sum it all up, it says, In Christ I am a loved, accepted child of the Father, and who I am is who I am in Him, in Jesus. And here's what we have found so far. First of all, we found that we are chosen. Of course, we got that from, uh, it, it, it just simply to, to sum that up, the, when we looked at that in, in detail, God in eternity past set His heart on me and you. <clears throat> Think about that for a second. Before he even bothered to create the universe, he set his heart on you and me. And we'll look at the verses briefly here in just a second. But in eternity past, he set his heart on us. And who I am in Christ has nothing to do with what I have done. It has everything to do with what God did before the world was. And if this was done before the world was, how could I have had anything to do with it? Who I am in Christ has nothing to do with what I've done. It has everything to do with what He did before 
we enter the picture. And our verse was verse 4. It says, just as He chose us in Him, that just the He, just as He, meaning God the Father, just as God chose us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. So we were, if you're familiar with this old statement, it's actually a biblical statement. We, we were the apple of, his, apple of His eye before we existed. Wow. I don't know about you, but that does a lot for, for my self-image. How I see myself. This isn't a Tony Robbins pep uh, rally. <laughs> this is, this is, these are the truths of how God sees us and who we are in Christ. And if you've been here, you know that we talked at length about the whole issue that comes up from the, this passage and a couple verses following about predestination that seems to divide so many people within the body of Christ. And I can tell you something right now, that if it divides people within the body of Christ, I can tell you it is that that is not of God. Nothing that God does or wants us to do should divide his family. We are to be united. But now I understand. Don't get all wrapped around the axle about this this whole thing. I'm going to have to sum up because I can't go back and teach the whole thing because it was a huge portion of the message. But, but don't get all uh, uh, wrapped up in the whole predestination thing. Because one thing we know, this statement is true. It's the Bible. We know it's true. It's inspired by God. And we also know that this is true. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Those are kind of two verses that represent the two opposite ends of the spectrum of this divisive mindset that people tend to, tend to, to uh, gravitate to one or the other and look at the other and totally dismiss anything they say. Well, you have to, literally, you have to dismiss other scripture if you're going to take one side and ignore the other. And, and, and I don't know about you, but the Bible insists that I teach the whole counsel of God. And because I can't, just because I can't see how those two issues, the fact that He chose us before we even existed, and that we have to call on Him to be saved, just because I can't see how those two exist in harmony doesn't mean they can't. It just means I don't understand. Guess what? There's a lot I don't understand. There's a lot you don't understand. There's a lot about God none of us understands. To think that we finite creatures of His creation could understand everything about the eternal creator of the universe the infinite creator of the universe, to think that we can understand everything about Him is presumptuous to say the least. And downright silly. <laughs> that would be like asking a first grader, a first grader to understand everything that a PhD understands. That's ridiculous. The capacity just is not there for us to understand all of that. <coughs> For a person to be saved, it is required that God chooses them. For a person to be saved, it is required that they call on Him. I love the, the old, I don't know if you know who Adrian Rogers was. He's a pastor of the Great Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis for a long time. <clears throat> he, he, he summed it all up like this. He said, when you get to heaven, you know, it just kind of, and you go to walk through the, the entryway, it's going to say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And it's like, yeah, that's me. And then when you get to the other side and you look back at the same gate, it's going to say chosen before the foundation of the world. Generally, we just have to leave the reconciliation of those two things to God. To somebody that understands things we cannot understand. I could not say that first line is chosen without going there. I hope that helped. Uh, it was awfully brief compared to what we looked at before. But secondly, we are adopted. In Christ, you and I have become a part of a family to which we did not originally belong. You were born in the earthly family, of course, but, but uh, we have been adopted into the family of God. And He brought us into His family not so that we could do something for Him. Do we really think we brought anything to the table? 
Like we said in small group the other night, the only thing that happened when we came on the end of the family of God is that the average dropped. <laughs> it wasn't so that we could do something for Him. It was so that we could simply be with Him because that's what He desired. Thirdly, we are loved. We know that the Bible teaches that. These are the things that we have found in so far in this mini-series called Knowing Who You Are. We know that we are loved. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ. God chooses to love us and nothing can make Him stop. Not you, not me, not circumstances, not all the demons of hell, not all the anything can make Him stop. It's His choice. He can do that if he wants. We are also accepted. God is pleased with you today because he is pleased with Christ. And you are, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are in Christ. You know, it, 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 it's, it, it's a package deal. We, we are now in Christ. God's view, uh, uh, the God the Father's view of Christ encompasses us. We are in Christ, and so He is pleased with who we are because we're forgiven. That makes us acceptable, even according to the absolute standard of God's standard of absolute perfection, because we have been forgiven. Past, present, future. I know that we have a hard time grasping the, the future thing there, but it had to be the future too. He couldn't have just forgiven us. Well, if He had just forgive, chosen to forgive us of our past sins and our present sins, but not our future sins, that means the next time that we sin, we would be disqualified from the family of God. We, what, what does it take to separate us from, sin, from God? One sin. We would have to get saved every time we sin. I'd be, I wouldn't be able to work. Have a day job. But I wouldn't be able to work. I'd be too busy asking God to save me all over again. And we are favored. You are always, as a child of God, as, one, as a follower of Jesus who is in Christ, you are always in a position of God's gracious favor toward you. Our children hold that place with us. Why wouldn't we think that we would with Him? We are also redeemed. You have been purchased from the bondage of sin through the precious blood of Christ and have been set free from its dominion over you. Wow. This just gets gooder and gooder. Speaking of forgiving me for the poor English, we are forgiven. <laughs> all the guilt. All the guilt associated with your sins, past, present, and future, has been removed. You do not bear the guilt of your own sins now. Jesus did that. And we have been given God's perspective. We have been given the wisdom and insight and the, and the mind of Christ into God's plan as He redeems mankind. We're privy to the, to the grandest plan ever devised. And these are the, the, this list of things, these are the realities that Paul is referring to when he said that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessings. That's what he's, the spiritual blessing. In the heavenly place, of this list, and thankfully even more, you can imagine. These are the spiritual blessings, that, that list of, and is a spiritual blessing. What, what is a spiritual blessing? Well, a spiritual blessing is an un un unending, Positional privilege, positional because we are in Christ, we're part of the family. Positional privilege of God's grace to those who are in Christ. These are things that we enjoy because we are in Christ. That's why we said, who I am is not who the world thinks I am. It's not who you think I am. 
It's not who I think I am. Those are all three different. It's not what my, who my neighbor thinks I am. That's it. That's different still. And they all fall short. Who I am is who I am in Christ. Who you are is who you are in Christ. Trust me, God sees you very differently now than He did before you became a Jesus follower. And you should too. But we let our old image of ourselves, we drag it from the other side of our salvation and we drag it with us and we smear the mirror with it and we have to look through it. That's not how God sees you. That's not how God sees me. It shouldn't be how we see one another and ourselves. And it's also, we talked about this last week, it's also not who you hope to grow up to be. It's who you are now because you're, if, if you are in Christ now. And the good news that there's more in Ephesians chapter 1. And Ephesians chapter 1 is not an exhaustive list. There's even more throughout the New Testament. More spiritual blessings that we enjoy because we are in Christ. And today we're going to wrap up that series, Knowing Who You Are, by looking at verses 11 through 14. First thing we're going to do is read the entirety of those four verses. Also, we have, now, now get this, he has just given us this list of things. And then he says, also, <laughs> also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. In other words, everything that He's doing is working towards the end goal that He already knows that He has planned. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. And in Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge for our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Well, from these three verse, these, these uh, four verses, I want to give you two more spiritual blessings that help define who we are. First of all, we are heirs. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever received an inheritance from anyone, but we pretty much all know who it is, what, what that means. And, uh, twice in these verses, Paul brings it up. He says in both 11 and 14, he says, also, we have obtained an inheritance. And then 11 and 14, he says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. An, an inheritance is, is to come into possession of that which belongs to someone else as a right based on my relationship with that person. You know, when, when my dad passed away, the, the Louisiana, it's, it's archaic, but the law in Louisiana demands that uh, when a father passes away, that what's left is divided up between, evenly, between the wife and the children. In our case, that, that meant with between five people, four siblings and my mother. Well, we all just signed it all over to my mom because obviously she deserved it and, and it was the right thing to do. And, and then when my mom passed away, the rest of us all signed it over to our sister because she was there for our parents. But, but it would have demanded once again to be split up between everybody. But the, the reason that it would be given to us is that it would have been, according to Louisiana law, our right based on our relationship with the one who passed. And so an inheritance is to come into possession of that which belongs to someone else as a right because of your relationship to them. And listen to what Romans chapter 8 says concerning this, this whole idea. And, and really helps define it. It says, For you have not been, you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Now the idea there is that he said, that's where you used to live. You know, before you before a person becomes a Christian, we are in fear. That's, there's a reason people fear death so much. And that because we all know somewhere deep inside there's going to be a reckoning. 
It says you have not received that again. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. But you received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And as you, we've said so many times, that is a really endearing term. It's like Papa or Daddy. He said, you, you, you haven't been given a, a spirit, an attitude of fear again like you used to have. You've been given the attitude of one who can come to God and say, Daddy, it's me, your son, your daughter. Wow, that's, that's not fear. And he goes on to say, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, well, heirs also. Heirs of God. And fellow heirs with Christ. We have an inheritance that we have, that we receive from God. And it says, fellow heirs. This is a very important top issue here. When it comes to our inheritance, when it says fellow heirs in the Greek, that's a that's a compound word. The root word to it is the word for inheritance. But the other word that's there is a word that means together. So in fact the King James puts it this way: joint heirs. Not alongside. Heirs, like, like my brothers and my sister and I, we would have each given a portion, our divided portion of our dad's inheritance. But what it means is not that we get our own, our own divided, divided portion of it, it's that we are all joint heirs. It's kind of like the first home Mandela and I ever bought was a condo in Colorado. And, and as you know, a lot of places like that, there are common areas. You don't get your just little section. You can enjoy the pool, the, the hot tub, the tennis courts, all that kind of stuff. You have full access to everything. That's what this means. That we aren't heirs in the, in the sense that we get a small portion of the inheritance. We, just like all the others in that are named, are full heirs with access to it all. That's very different. And the Greek is very specific to make sure to point that out. To be fellow heirs of Christ means everything he has... What belongs to him belongs to me. His riches are my riches. His resources, my resources. His power, his position, his privilege are my power, my position, and my privilege as well. Now, you can be like the Mr. Walker that I talked about a few weeks back, the guy who inherited what in today's money is almost $42 million, but died an a, 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 a absolute mess in, a, in the doorway of a flop house in Chicago in 1950, even though, it, and the people, people all over the country were looking for him, trying to find him, telling him he had this wonderful amount of money that he inherited. And he had, for years, he was still living like that while the inheritance was just waiting for him. We can do that. We can, we can pretend that we don't have an inheritance. We can say that, well, you know, because of who I think I am, I'm looking at this smeared vision in the mirror. I, I, I don't really deserve all that stuff, so I'll just be my little pitiful self. That's not how God sees us. He very intentionally made us joint heirs with His own Son. John MacArthur says it like this. says, in Jesus Christ, believers inherit every promise God has ever made. Our, our every conceivable need is met by God's gracious provision in accordance with His divine promises. We are promised peace. And I tell you what, if that was the totality of the list, I'd, I'd be shouting amen. Now granted, these things that we see, some of them are our future to be delivered. Some of them we have to embrace in order to live, deliver them. Some of them are unconditional blessings. But, but one way or another, they are all ours. God's gracious provision in accordance with His divine promises. We are promised peace, love, that's unconditional. Grace, that's unconditional. Wisdom, that's something that we are told over and over and over to pursue. But it's ours to have. Eternal life, we have that if we're followers of Jesus. Joy, that means getting close to Jesus so the things around you don't steal it. 
victory that may be in the future for you, may be in your past, may be today. Strength, guidance, power, mercy, forgiveness, righteousness, truth, fellowship with God. John MacArthur doesn't usually do this. <laughs> but I can just see him. Just, wow, he's given us this. And the list just getting longer and longer and longer and longer. Fellowship with God, spiritual discernment, heaven, eternal riches, glory. Those and every good thing that comes from God. Because we have been made joint heirs with Christ, we are guaranteed possession of everything He possesses. Wow. God is good to us. Well, three things Paul said about this inheritance. First of all, it's ours. In Ephesians 1.11, it says that also we have obtained an inheritance. Notice that it says we have obtained. It's past tense. That means it's done. It is ours. Have we completely received all of it yet? No. You could go to a, the reading of a will, and before you get to the bank, it, it's yours, but before you get to the bank, you haven't yet received it. Before you get to the estate, you haven't yet received it. Whatever. Well, there are some of, there are some of our inheritance that we haven't received yet, but it is past tense. It is a done thing. Listen to what Peter says about this. This is great. About our inheritance, even though we haven't received it all yet, still certainly being ours. In 1 Peter it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. The word reserved means to be to keep an eye on something or to guard over something. The parts of our inheritance that, that we will not get here, we will eventually get. And they are under lock and key, if you will. They are being guarded right now, waiting in reserve for us. <coughs> but from the same portion of that verse, it is ours by God's sovereign grace. The word obtained there, in the Greek, that is written in passive voice, which means that the subject is the recipient of the action. We have obtained. It didn't say we have attained. That would be the active voice where we would have been the one taking the action and making something happen. But in the passive voice means that we are the recipients and passive means that we had no role in it. So there we have obtained, not attained. We have been given through no act of our own an inheritance. And then to make sure that, that this inheritance, that we understand that this inheritance is ours through God's grace and not something that we do, Paul then says this in the rest of that verse. We have obtained an inheritance having been, been predestined according to his purpose. That means to be planned ahead. We had nothing to do with it. It was all the goodness of God towards those that He set His heart on before the foundation of the world. <coughs> Amen. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> this, this is just, this is amazing. Unless you just don't believe it. To, to, to escape the glorious position that we have in the eyes of God, you will have to ignore the Word of God. Oh, but to embrace it. Again, predestined means to be determined ahead of time. It is ours 
but along this, if you hadn't noticed yet, we're kind of compiling, building to make a sentence. It is ours by God's sovereign grace for His glory. It's not just something that we say, wow, this is great. This is something that we say, wow, this is great. All glory to you for it, God. I have no claim to any of the credit of the glory for these wonderful things that He's bestowed upon me, nor do you. If we did, if, we, if it was because of something we had done, we would have some claim, some rightful claim on the part of the Lord. But it's not. It's all an act of God and His goodness towards us. Therefore, He gets all the glory. To the, 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 the very next verse, verse 12, it points it out that it's all for His glory. To the end that, talk about us having all these things, here's, the, here's what it's all working towards. To the end that, this is the end goal, the end result, the, that it's all we're headed towards, that we would be to the praise of His glory. Our lives, our gratitude unto God ought to spill over to people around us. They ought to look at us and say, wow, God has been good to them. i got to give you some of that. Throughout eternity, from now throughout eternity, our lives should be a crescendo of praise that glorifies Him for His goodness. But not only are we heirs, we are sealed. Verse 13 says this, says, In Him you also, after listening to the message of, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, you were sealed. This is aorist passive. We've already talked about passive. Aorist means, in the Greek, means that something was done at a specific point in time. That it's a completed action that was done at a specific point. Regardless of who it's talking about doing it, whether it's us, whether it's God, the aorist means that it was done. It's, it's like a, the dot of an eye or the, or the period after a sentence. It is a done thing that was done at a specific point of time. Not ongoing, but done at a single point with ongoing results. So it was done at a specific point in time. And the passive part means that we, the subjects, are the recipients and not the, the initiators or the instigators, if you will. We were sealed. It was done at a point in time and we had nothing to do with it. We were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, what does it mean to be sealed? Well, first of all, a seal is a sign of a finished transaction. You ever, anybody here ever watch the show American Pickers? <clears throat> Well, I, I, I'm just addicted to that show. I, I, I love the old stuff. Raise your hand. I don't even know if I need to just go past this illustration. Nobody <laughs> you know, what is it they do? I'm, I'm, I may also needed somebody to answer this question for me. What is it that, that they do when they agree on a price and the, tra and the transaction gets sealed? They shake hands. You know, that's how it is where I grew up. That's how, when they shake hands, that transaction has been sealed. The deal has been agreed to on both sides and the transaction has been sealed. It's a similar uh, concept here. From Romans 15 it says, Therefore, when I have finished this, now, now let me go back and set the stage. Paul in Romans is of course writing, even Romans is of course writing to the people in Rome. He was telling them of his desire to come see them. But he had something he had to do first. The people of Achaia and Macedonia had taken up a bunch of money that they wanted to give to the Christians in Jerusalem because they were suffering so much persecution and being uh, disfurnished of their homes, their livelihoods, and all kinds of stuff. And so they were being, and they were, they were suffering in poverty, many of them. And so the, the people, these Gentile believers in Achaia and Macedonia, because of their Respect and regard and concern for the Christians in uh, Jerusalem. They took up money, gave it to Paul, said, we want to help them. But Paul's saying here, I, I want to come see you, but first I have to do something. And this is what he says. that therefore, when I have finished this end, when I have done that job, and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go, go on by my way of Spain to you. So what he's saying here is, 
this transaction has to be finished. I have been given the responsibility, probably sat down with some other guys, counted it, and, and wrote it down. Like, you know, and then said, I am responsible for delivering this very amount of money to the Christians in, in Jerusalem. And he said, once I had put my seal on it, not a, probably not a physical seal at all, just the simple fact that it was a finished transaction, and he was uh, supervising it and ensuring it all along the way. So he said, once I finish this and have put my seal on that transaction, then I'll come see you. So this is Paul saying that he would finish the transaction of making sure that they received the gift, the entire gift. And to be sealed means that we aren't hoping to be made right. We aren't hoping to be made right. We have been made right. Our, our verse tells us that we are sealed in Christ. We aren't hoping to be made right someday. We are right with God today. Now you may be thinking, well, you, you just a little earlier, you, you led us to pray in confession of sins. Yes, I did. But that has no nothing to do with our position in Christ. We are because we are forgiven in Christ and we are accepted, loved children of God. Now granted, in practice, we do mess up. And that, that's why there's the whole biblical process of sanctification, whereby we are in a process from the day of our salvation to the day we leave this world of becoming more and more like Christ, with the Holy Spirit reminding us of things that we should be and be doing and saying, reminding us, and we are constantly striving, I hope, to be more and more like Jesus. I hope you haven't plateaued or stagnated. But we are to be in that process constantly when, when we overcome one thing in our life, then we're, Holy Spirit, what's next? I want to be a faithful follower of Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. <clears throat> you, you won't get there completely. You'll never arrive. But you ought to be get, getting closer. But as far as our position with Christ, that's not changed. Practical day, daily living, that, that, well, that's obviously another story, amen? Don't look at me all spiritual like that. <laughs> <laughs> living it out is another story. But that transaction has been completed. The death, burial, and resurrection. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. transaction of making us right with God is in the past tense. Well, secondly, a seal is a sign of authenticity. John chapter 6 says this about God the Father and Jesus the Son. It said, for on Him, on Jesus, the Father, God, has set His seal. Now, when did that happen? It happened at Jesus' baptism when God the Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. That's, that's what it says. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. This was God putting His sign of authenticity on Jesus as the Messiah that had been sent. And you know, that had that been long promised and sent. But also in the New Testament, you, you may know this, but the Apostle Paul attracted haters like lights attract bugs. Uh, they, they just followed him everywhere. And one of the things they did to try to discredit him was to say that he wasn't truly an apostle, which is, of course, absurd. But, you know, when you're trying to just tear someone down, if you don't have the truth, you're stuck with just using lies. Uh, but in defending the, authentic, the, the authenticity of his apostleship in 1 Corinthians 9, he said this to the, to the people of Corinth. He said, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. He said, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Because he had been living with them, he had been ministering to them, and what had happened in their, their lives as he was doing all the things that apostles do, reflect the authenticity of his apostleship. He, you know, Paul wasn't real big on it. He, he said, I'm, you know, nobody else believes it, but I know you do. And you 
the results of what God has done through me are the seal of authenticity on my apostleship. That's good enough for me. Then thirdly, a seal is a sign of ownership. You know, in, in seminary, a lot of guys had one of these. I was, we were just broke all the time, and so I didn't have one of these. But you could take your uh, a, a, a book and you, and you could get yourself one of those uh, seals that were kind of like the, the older style uh, notary public. You know, it's not just an ink stamp. It, it's it's a seal, and, and it, it it's it's engraved, and both sides mesh into one another. And you take it, you you take a page, and you put it on there, and you press it, and it says this book belongs to and has your name in it. Well, that's kind of the idea of the. Uh, the, the seal being a sign of, of ownership. I want you to listen to this verse of some end time stuff from the book of Revelation. I'm talking about God's seal of ownership over His own people. From Revelation chapter 9 it says, Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth had power. In other words, they were given the ability to, to inflict painful stains into people, unlike what we know from locusts now. And, and they, were, uh, they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree. That's what locusts usually did. But they were to be given a different assignment. They were going to inflict pain, it says, but only hurt the men who do not have the seal of God. This is one of those terrible things that's going to happen in the end times with, the, with those people who were on earth and had the seal of God, God ownership on them, were going to be spared it. Well, first, fourthly, a seal is a sign of protection. You know, uh, you, you may have already gone here mentally and, and with a mental picture of, of a wax seal. And I, I don't mean just like that, just covers or something, but I mean a, an actual seal. You know, you can, you can buy these. They're real popular on Amazon today. A lot of people are using them for uh, wedding invitations and the like. And what you do is you, you melt the wax. In fact, uh, for just a few dollars more, you can get an entire kit. <laughs> it, ha it has the seal. You notice that uh, the, the seal has, in this instance, a letter. It would be the letter of your last name. You can order it with whatever letter your last name starts with. And the idea is that you use the candle and you drip wax, uh, for instance, on the seal of a letter or an invitation, and then you use the seal to put your symbol in it. In this case, it's just a letter. But back in the day, it was used like a family crest or, a, or the royal arms or something like that. Uh, and in fact, kings would use them on, on people of authority would use seals to protect. Remember what we said, this, the seal is a sign of protection. They would use seals on things like letters. And you could even get signet. My, my graduation ring from seminary is a signet ring, but it's, it's a signet, I meaning it's a sign of who you are. And when you put, put the, the wax on the envelope to, to make sure that you're this is sitting around somewhere with somebody taking it and sealing things in your name. They started making rings out of them so that nobody could use it without your permission. And so the idea is you would pour the wax on an, on an envelope or a package or something and put the seal on it. And whoever you were, if you, if you were powerful, if you were rich, or if you were a king, what that did is it told anybody that, that was tempted to open that package that everything that stands behind the person wearing this ring or using that seal, he can bring to bear on top of your head if you open it without permission. And, and couriers would take those letters and they'd put them in pouches and they would protect them with their lives because they knew if the seal got broken, they would be blamed for it. The contents of the letter and the package was protected by all the forces of, that, that a king could bring to bear. And we even see this in Scripture in Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. You remember that when Jesus was crucified, he was put in the tomb. And then you read this. And they went and made the grave secure 
and along with the guard, there, later in the next chapter it says soldiers, it didn't mean just a single guard, it was the, the guard, the contingency, whatever that looked like. Along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. It means that they put a seal on the stone, and, and anybody that would break it would be risking having the entire Roman army at their disposal to be to be brought to bear on the person that broke the seal. Because what they were doing is the religious leaders of the day came and said, man, they they said that he's going to raise the third day. And we need to make sure that nobody comes and steals his body and claims that he raised the third day because then we're going to have a harder time getting rid of this whole Christian thing than we did before. And so as a result, the very seal that they put on it kept people away. Ensuring that nobody came and stole the body, which proves the fact that the, yeah, the body wasn't stolen, but that Jesus instead rose from the dead. So the very thing they, they, they tried to use to keep people from believing that the three-day resurrection would really happen actually caused to prove that it happened because nobody dared with the guards there and with the seal. Nobody dared touch it. And just pointing to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus in no more fashion. Well, <clears throat> for us to be sealed means that our eternal relationship with the Father is protected. John 10 says this, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We are secure. If you are in Christ, there is nothing that can happen that changes that. Because we are in Christ, our relationship with the Father is as secure as the relationship that exists between the Father and the Son. Because we are in Christ. That's what it means to be sealed. So what does it actually look like to be sealed? Well, how does, how does that actually happen? Well, we're sealed by being given the Holy Spirit. Back to our passage. I'll pick it up. I didn't realize we were going so long. You were sealed in Him, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge or an earnest. How many of you know what earnest money is? Yeah, you go to buy something, and it is especially like a, a home or something, and you give them earnest money. That is what you give them somewhat as a down payment, if you will, but it does more than reduce the balance. It, it is your pledge to come back and finish what you started. And if you don't come back and finish what you started, what happens? You lose it. You lose it. And that's what this word means. In fact, King James uses the word earnest. The Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge for our inheritance with a view with what's coming down the road, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. This is the down payment and the promise to finish what He started. The Holy Spirit dwelling in us in us. That's how secure we are. Well, when were we sealed? Very quickly. First of all, we have to hear the gospel. In Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In order to be sealed, in order to be in Christ, in order to take advantage and be the recipient of all of these spiritual blessings that we've talked about, you have to first hear the Christ, the, hear the gospel of Christ, the message of truth. And then secondly, we must believe that gospel. In Him, you also, have, after having listened to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The word believe there means to put your trust in. It's not just to say, I believe that happened one day. It's to put your trust in. It's to look at this and say, I've heard the gospel. I've heard, I've heard that I'm a sinner separated from God and that Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus died to fix my problems. And He raised again to walk in the of life. So will I. No trust in if you have heard of the gospel, and if you have believed and put your trust in the gospel for your salvation, you are sealed and you're safe. Let's pray. As our prayer partners come forward to.